Welcome friends, Russ Barkley here. And in this particular short commentary, we're going to talk about whether or not neuroimaging scans can be used to diagnose ADHD. But first, uh, it's almost time for Talk Like a Pirate Day, and that'll be coming up here in mid-September. So, Hi, let's uh, start to get in the mood for that one. That should be a fun day. Uh, so in this presentation, uh, I want to focus on the various neuroimaging techniques that have been used in research and see if they can be used in clinical practice for making a diagnosis of ADHD. So uh, let's get started. Let me tee up my PowerPoint. <laughs> and there we go. Um, so can neuroimaging be used to diagnose ADHD? After all, we see hundreds of studies using these methods in the literature to evaluate ADHD as compared to typical or other groups that have a clinical diagnosis. So uh, there's a variety of techniques out there. I'll just review them very quickly for you. Uh, and it really depends on which of these one is going to use uh, as to how much resolution of the brain you get or how much of the brain's functioning uh, is activated and detected by the device, among, among other things. So uh, first of all, uh, starting at the beginning, we had the old CAT or CT scans that took a look at the structure of the brain. These, of course, have gotten better over time, and the images are much better than they used to be back in the 70s when this method was first being used in research and practice. Uh, that was followed by the development of magnetic resonance imaging uh, that looked at brain structure, both the whole brain and regions within the brain. Uh, and it uses uh, a form of detection of magnetic differences in the brain. So you sit inside a giant magnet and this magnet helps to reorganize, if you will, or reorient the electrons in the brain, or the, um, excuse me, uh, the structure of the brain, not just the electrons. And by doing so, it's able to take an image of the brain. So it's using magnetism to see the brain. Uh, and then, of course, we have the latest developments starting over oh, a decade or so ago, which is diffusion tensor imaging and it uses the movement of water through tissues in the brain and how much resistance that water is getting and that allows us to look at the different kinds of brain tissue and structure and make an image of it. It's primarily used to study not so much the cortex of the brain but the white matter microstructure that is the fibers that uh, are deep within the brain that connect the various brain regions to each other. So notice that these three method, methods are looking at structure. Uh, and then, of course, we have measures of function. Uh, one of the first to de be developed was the SPEC scan, single photon emission computerized tomography, where you uh, expose the individual to a very small amount of radioactive substance. Uh, and that gets into the blood, into the brain, and the scanner is able to detect where this blood is going uh, and therefore give us some picture of how active certain brain structures are uh, in, say, certain tasks or in resting states and so on. And we can compare these states of activity between, say, ADHD groups and typical groups to see if there's a difference in brain activity. The next one is the positron emission tomography known as the PET scan. Uh, it's also looking at brain activity. It's using a different form of exposure to radioactive substances. And again, it's detecting that radioactivity within the brain. Uh, the exposure to radiation in these studies is very, very small. Uh, it's still something that one has to pay attention to, but uh, it's quite small. So. Uh, it's not to worry about. It's not like you're making somebody radioactive in that sense, but it is still a concern when it comes to the ethics of using these particular scans. They have to sort of be justifiable given the exposure. Uh, and then we have another functional measure, which is taking the MRI and reanalyzing the data produced by the MRI to look at function. And so the individual in the scanner usually is in a resting state, 
uh, and then is asked to do a task. And they compare the two states, the resting and the task state, to take a look at what parts of the brain are activating in response to this challenge or this task. Uh, and then finally, there is functional connectivity measures of MRI. And what this is doing is very similar to the functional MRI, except it is now looking at how different brain regions activate when others are activating. So are they connected? Are they related? Are they inhibitory? Is one activating while it is inhibiting other parts of the brain? So it's really looking at the connectivity of the brain as it functions, as it performs a task, a, a fascinating uh, set of, of procedures and scans here that you're seeing on this slide, the, the wonders of modern physics and, and medicine here. Here's what the scans look like. I'll just go through these very quickly since this really isn't the point of this presentation. But here's the original CT scan. You can see it's giving us an image of the brain's structure, both the cortex you see up here, as well as the white matter, and even down into structures like the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, hippocampus, and so on. Uh, Next up is that MRI scan. Again, looking at structure, but notice that the resolution of the scan much more detailed in the MRI usually than we see in the CT scan. You can even see uh, a variety of structures inside the brain, uh, not just the outside cortical area as well. So uh, very helpful for researchers and in clinical practice in neurology. Uh, and then this is that tensor, excuse me, tensor imaging. Let's go back here. And you can see here that what this is doing is looking at the diffusion of water through the brain. We can pick up uh, the uh, degree of material or structure in the brain based on how much water passes through it. And that gives us a pattern of this kind of network. Uh, it's not measuring function. It's looking at structure, but what it's looking at uh, as you can see here is primarily white matter, how these fibers of white matter connect up different areas of gray matter to each other and crisscross the brain. So uh, absolutely fascinating sort of scanning. By the way, differences in research have been found between ADHD and typical individuals on all of these structural scan measures. But I have to say that the most detailed and the greatest differences have been revealed, as far as I know, with the diffusion tensor imaging, because it's showing that there's not only smaller regional differences in these brain structures, as revealed by the other scans, but there's greater disruption in these white matter subcortical fibers, as evident on the diffusion tensor images. Down below here, you see the SPEC scan. Uh, this is a measure of, as I said, uh, blood flow into the brain, looking at the emission of these single photons. And it kind of shows us how active the brain is, as inferred from how much blood is being called into that area to activate it. Uh, this is what Dan Amen is using in his Amen clinics throughout the US. He claims that he can diagnose ADHD he has identified seven subtypes of ADHD, and he can even use these scans to predict drug response to ADHD. So I'm, I'm most often asked about whether you can do that with uh, SPEC scanning, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, but the shorter answer is no. Uh, and then there is the PET scan, which is also a measure of brain activity, as we said, looking at uh, detecting small amounts of radioactivity within the brain, and that reveals how active these particular brain areas are. Uh, also, much more resolution in the PET scan than we typically see in a SPEC scan, uh, though SPEC scanning is certainly improving to some extent in that matter. Uh, finally, over here on this uh, slide, you see the results of functional MRI. So here's the MRI showing structure right here in the second image. And over here on the right is the fMRI scan. And that is showing how different brain areas are activating during a particular task that the individual 
has been given. So it's not only showing structure, but it actually is showing activation of these regions. Uh, finally, functional connectivity fMRI is looking at how the different brain areas activate relative to each other. So when one is active, what else is active during a task? When one is passive, what others are passive? When one activates, does it inhibit other regions? And so on. And you can see here during a particular task how different areas of the brain are connecting to each other in terms of their functional activity. So when they're activated, other parts of the brain are activating as well, or perhaps not activating, but being suppressed. So uh, again, a very interesting research methodology. So why can't neuroimaging be used for clinical diagnosis of ADHD? Because at this point, it can't. No one has been able to accurately classify cases of ADHD relative to typical cases using these methods in clinical practice or even in research. So, uh, so why is it? I mean, after all, we got all of these research studies showing lots of differences between ADHD groups and typical groups on all of these various scanning devices. So why can't we use it for clinical practice? Well, here's why. Let's go back to the point I just said. Imaging methods are very useful in research studies, but that's because we compare large groups of individuals, say ADHD, versus typical. So we're comparing groups and many people within the group, and we average their scans together, and therefore we compare the differences in the means of these groups to each other. So think of two bell curve distributions, one for ADHD, one for typical people on the scan, and we're comparing their means. And oftentimes there are statistically significant differences between these means. And so the paper has a positive finding that there are these imaging differences between these groups. But let me point out something. The differences in these studies are so small that it takes comparison of groups, many people within these groups, to detect the group differences. That's what studies are looking at, group differences. What clinicians are looking at is how a single individual differs from other typical individuals. So clinicians are comparing and classifying cases, not comparing two groups on average differences. So the more two groups overlap with each other in their scanning, the less useful that scan will be in clinical practice. Uh, and that is what clinicians are trying to do. So if the differences between groups are very small, they cannot be seen on an individual, a single person's scan by a clinician so as to classify or diagnose them, even though that imaging device might well have proven useful when comparing groups. So for any scan or test to help us with clinical diagnosis, the distribution of scores for the ADHD group must be tremendously different from the distribution of scores for the typical group. The two distributions almost should not be overlapping with each other so that we can see that the scan or scores of people in one group are going to be dramatically different from those in the typical group. But we don't see that. We see that these distributions highly overlap. And so while there are small differences that are significant in research studies when groups are compared, those differences are not striking enough to be useful to classify people when we look at single scans of an individual. So uh, that's the point here. The neuroimaging is not useful in clinical practice because the differences from typical people are rather small. If we look at brain volume of the cortex, let's say it's about three to five percent smaller in people with ADHD than in typical people. Uh, and if we look at 
activity differences or regional differences in activity, it might be anywhere from 10 to 25 percent less active. These are not profound differences, and they would be hard to spot on an individual scan. So the bottom line, folks, is that at, at this time, neuroimaging cannot be used in clinical practice for making a diagnosis, for subtyping people with ADHD, or for planning treatment with ADHD. So that means that if people in practice are offering neuroimaging, claiming they can do these things, like the Amen clinics claim to be able to do, they can't. Uh, so that's a big problem out there. There are people using devices and making claims about them when the research base for doing so simply doesn't support the use in clinical practice. I don't know any neuroimagers working in the field of ADHD that are recommending neuroimaging for clinical diagnosis. So uh, buyer beware out there if you're running into people offering scans claiming to do things like diagnosis, subtyping, treatment planning, when in fact they cannot do so. Perhaps in the future, these images will be come so good at res resolving these differences at their resolution uh, that maybe they can start to be used for diagnosis. I think maybe diffusion tensor imaging may be moving in that direction because of the high resolution of these differences. But it's not there yet, and there's a long way to go. Uh, so again, be careful out there because you can spend good money on neuroimaging, and uh, it's not going to be able to give you the answer you want. Okay, so thanks for joining me uh, on this presentation. Again, recommend this channel to others if you would, uh, if you like the material. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button and join us. So thanks again. Hope to see you in another commentary. Be well, everybody.